Hey everyone, Dennis Chang here. I'm back in Montreal and quite jet lagged. What you just saw was a tune um, played by myself on rhythm guitar, my buddies Bren on violin, Quinn on lead guitar, and Olivier on bass. So today's video is something that I'm quite passionate about. Uh, the title says Gypsy Jazz Rhythm, but it applies to jazz music in general or even just playing um, in an ensemble. But today it's going to be with a special focus on the role of the rhythm guitar in a gypsy jazz or trad jazz setting. First, I need to plug the usual. If you enjoy what I do, please like, subscribe, comment, share, whatever. It makes a huge, huge difference. If you want to support what I do, um, please consider buying something from DC Music School or Soundslice. I have gypsy jazz beginner courses, bebop courses on Soundslice. And on DC Music School, you have tons of things. And you'll find the links in the description box. In a few days, I'll be teaching at Django in June in Northampton, Massachusetts. And then the week after, I'll be playing at the Django Reinhardt Festival with uh, Vavau Adler and Jimmy Rosenberg. So, hope to see some of you guys somewhere. <laughs> As many of you know, I was stuck in Asia for almost two years and a half. And I did quite a lot of uh, deep thinking about music. About what I like about music. I did a lot of playing with many local musicians and made a lot of observations about music education, about how people choose to play what they play. For me, one thing that plays a huge role in how much I enjoy the music is the tightness of an ensemble, how together they are and how they work together to make good music. This is a very subjective topic and there are no rules. This video is not a how to play in an ensemble tutorial. But it's, it's a philosophical video to get you guys to think a little bit about um, philosophical issues regarding playing in ensemble. I'll be talking about subtle but important details that make up the big picture. When you look at a typical jazz ensemble, you typically have a drummer, a bassist, and then maybe you have chordal instruments such as piano or guitar, or sometimes both at the same time. What is the role of each instrument? And this can end up being a very long video and maybe we can talk about different scenarios. But today we'll be talking specifically about, well, this formation that you saw, bass and rhythm guitar. And more specifically, a rhythm guitar player doing this kind of thing. Which is something that you'll encounter in gypsy jazz and also in a lot of uh, traditional jazz or big band music. What makes this particularly difficult to talk about uh, and to teach is that it is, as I said, very subjective and there are no specific rules. I think the best way to learn about ensemble playing is to have opportunities to work with great leaders who have great musical visions. It's like an orchestra working under a, a great conductor. And the more great leaders you get to work with, the more you'll understand what I mean when I say there are no rules. Every now and then I get emails from people who are asking uh, about lessons and a lot of them want to get better at playing rhythm. Now, of course, sure, we can talk about certain sound issues, technical issues. I can show little tricks here and there. But beyond that, the ability to play good rhythm, to lock in and play musically, it cannot be learned through traditional lessons. You have to learn this skill while on the job. Um, the past few weeks, actually, I was supposed to be on tour in the United States with some friends of mine, Duved. <laughs> but I turned down that gig because I basically wanted to stay in Japan. So sorry, guys, but I'll see you guys next week. I thought this was a golden opportunity to convince my friends to hire someone whom I thought would benefit tremendously from working with them. They hired my buddy from Wisconsin for a number of gigs in the Midwest. And I know that my buddy really, really wanted to develop his accompaniment skills but he was at a level where no lesson could help him and he basically needed to do to be working with great players so I basically connected Duved with John I'm very happy that he apparently did a very good job Duved was very happy he learned a lot from Duved from playing with Duved and Daniel and let's just watch a little video of them <laughs>
I'm hoping that Jan will have many more opportunities to work with amazing players in the future. Because there are so many ways to a company out there and everything depends on so many factors. The differences are sometimes also very, very subtle. Just before the pandemic, um, I had to work with Samson Schmidt and Duvet as well. Within like a two month period, I was playing bass and my buddy Zach was the rhythm guitarist. We worked together to train him to play with both Samson and um, Duved, who have very, very different musical styles and musical visions. I explained to Zach that playing with Samson would be very different from playing with Duved in so many ways. And when we finally played together, Zach understood what I meant. Different sound, different time feel, just a different vibe overall. Again, all these things that you can only learn when you play with good musicians. Uh, musicians that you really want to play with, ideally, and hopefully are willing to give you a chance. The subjective nature is what makes it very difficult to teach. And when people come to me for advice on accompaniment, of course, I do share with them my experiences of having worked with a number of great players. But from a practical point of view, um, I basically have them play with me, and I explain to them that, of course, when they work with me, they are working according to my vision of how accompaniment should be. And that could easily be very different from what other players might want. And even with me, one day I may be in the mood for a particular way of accompaniment, and the next day might become something completely different, like the, the exact opposite. That bass player that you saw behind me, Olivier, is one of my favorites here in Montreal. Um, for me, when it comes to gypsy jazz, he he's the best here. Uh, well, my favorite anyway. <laughs> We've played together for a number of years now, and when we play, we all, it was always fun to discuss different fields and try different things. And uh, not that we ever rehearsed so much <laughs> back in the day, but from time to time, I'd communicate different ideas to try, and it's always a blast playing with them. The first thing we can already talk about is time feel. And the truth is that it is not possible to be perfect like a metronome. We are human with our own imperfections. But these imperfections are not only natural, but they actually contribute greatly to the quality of the music. How we then control these imperfections is what is important, in my opinion. No matter who we are, we will have off days. But hopefully, the better you are, the less likely that you're going to have off days. Hopefully, you're going to be somewhat consistent. Now, there are fun things that I like to do with the metronome, which we won't do today. But... Accompaniment goes beyond um, using the metronome due to the imperfections that we are likely to encounter. The ensemble is only as good as its weakest link. And in an ideal situation, it's not about following the drummer or the bassist or whatever. The ideal situation is that everyone is on the same page in constant communication. And it's a very organic process. And when this works, it's really an amazing feeling. When we are on the same page, we constantly adjust from beat to beat to each other's tendencies. And that's why our tendencies have to be on the same wavelength. With that said, I have to make a disclaimer that this, that this video is about, I guess, the higher tier of rhythm playing where we're concerned with very, very subtle details. If you're starting out or just a beginner, just use a metronome <laughs> and work on being as tight as you can. Don't worry too much about these details that I'll be talking about in a moment. There are so many time fields out there with their own little sub variations. In the end, it's a question of feel and instinct rather than something that we intellectualize. It's also very hard to generalize. For me, for example, in gypsy jazz, a lot of players tend to drive the beat, like they tend to push the beat, whereas this tendency to, to accelerate. And some players more so than others. It's a spectrum. I've talked about this in previous videos. For me personally, I don't like it when it drives too hard. When it drives in such a way that to experienced ears, it's noticeable right off the bat. What is ideal for me is when it drives in such a subtle way that even experienced players barely realize it's pushing. I mean, of course, they will realize it if they they have good ears, but it, it's so, so very subtle. It's a fine line. And let's actually watch a little video of this where beforehand I talked to Olivier about, let's play this tune and let's drive 
a little bit. A, a little bit more than I usually like to, but not as much as some gypsy jazz players tend to do. Let's, let's check it out. If you're playing in this boom chick kind of way with the accent on two and four, one thing you can kind of mentally visualize is to have the two and four uh, be ever, ever so slightly ahead of the beat. Therefore, this is something that you can't practice with a metronome. It's something you'll have to kind of feel. And because you will place the two and four ever so slightly ahead of the beat, it will inevitably also affect the one, three, one and three in some way so you have this feeling of drive and it's more of a visualization a psychological way of thinking about the rhythm whether you actually put the two and four or not is up to debate well I, i've actually analyzed <laughs> i'm a nerd but i've actually analyzed um waveforms where i do see the two and four beings ever so slightly ahead depending on depending on the player and because on the two and four you have that accent, I tend to try to think of having a quicker attack. So it will be, I mean, if I'll do it slowly, it'll sound like this. I'd be curious to see this on a waveform. Let me try it again. One, two, I want two, three, four. So it's a, it's a visualization thing. In, uh, when I have the twin four, I tell myself, whatever I do, don't, don't hold back, go for it. But at the same time, I go for it, but I control myself so it doesn't end up being like, one, two, one, two, three, four. Which quite a lot of gypsy jazz players tend to do. 
for a lot of swing music and gypsy jazz music, this is something that I, this is a field that I really like. But that's with that said, there are of course exceptions, and it depends on the mood, the song, the players. Sometimes it's also good to be more on the relaxed side of the beat. These are things that you just have to learn. You have to learn to feel out on your own, or have a leader that you trust. And if they tell you to be more relaxed or to be more um, excited in your in your rhythm playing, you just have to adapt. <laughs> Here, working with the bass player, we hopefully listen to each other so that we're tight together. And again, we both have to be very confident in our time feel. It's not about one person leading the other, but it's an equal exchange, an equal collaboration. We're listening to each other and we adjust from beat to beat. Then there's the issue of sound and playing style, which opens another can of worms. And there's so many possibilities here. Should the rhythm player be doing like the mid-1930s hot club style? Should it be more muted? Should we not use an upstroke? Should it be more equal? Should it be more accented? Less accented? Um, Fuller chords, smaller chords, etc. There are so many possibilities. How loud am I supposed to play as well? I have a lot of opinions on this, but these are things that are decided based on careful listening and on my vision at the given moment. For, for example, in terms of play, how, how hard do I hit the strings? In this room, it's a, it's a pretty decent room that's acoustically treated. So I don't have to push as hard. The room is doing some work for me with the reverb and the reflection. But outdoors, when it's, there's no reflection, I tend to hit the strings a little bit harder so that the, the projection works better. Furthermore, if we're playing a live concert, if we have a microphone, if we have a pickup, how loud the mics are, how loud the pickups are, it affects how I play as well. I'm always listening and trying to, to figure out what the best way of playing might be based on what I hear. I also consider the other instruments. How loud are they playing? If someone's playing very quietly, then I have to adjust. I don't want to over, overwhelm them. If I'm playing an electric guitar, and depending on the amp settings, how loud it is, depending on the guitar, again, I adjust my playing style, whether I use full chords, smaller chords, um, heavy attack, light attack, etc. For example, if I'm working with a drummer that's driving the beats, accenting the beats very well, I'm personally less likely to do something like this and something more like this just to support. Maybe less legato even. Etc. I just listen, listen, listen. And then I, I play and I listen to what I play, listen to what they're doing, and decide for myself, does this sound good or doesn't sound good? You can even record yourself it's, if it's hard for you to listen as you play. For example, if there's a bass player, the bass is an instrument, the bass frequencies don't, um, don't travel in the same way that the higher fre frequencies do. And often it's better to play softly than to play like this. So if there's a bass solo, I might be doing something more like this. Or even to give room for the bass frequencies. Let's listen to a tune, let's listen to a ballad and listen to how we change the sound as we play.
There we go. That was a little ballad. And then, okay, let's move on. Then we have these little special things like certain accents or different special sounds. Personally, I don't like, I don't think that the rhythm should be like a robot. There needs to be some kind of musical flexibility, but you have to find the right balance so as not to become overbearing. I've told this story before, but when I was younger, I thought I was being really creative and really cool and doing all these things like, um, uh, retrospect that is the lamest thing ever and um, it's something that I came to realize on my own one day is like wait there's a reason why all the best players don't do anything like that so of course you want to be musical you want to do you want to be more than just doing like you want to play with the sound but you have to find the right balance for example if you're playing all of me you know So you hear all these little different things I did and even then maybe it was still a little bit too much but I just want to demonstrate how possible how it's possible to to greatly, how do you say, change the mood by doing s subtle things like this. Then you have the bass. How should it be played? There are so many different possibilities. But I do feel that in this context, the guitar and bass should fit together. Now, fit together doesn't necessarily mean that they have to play the ex with the exact same sound. It just means they have to complement each other Complementing each other doesn't mean can sometimes mean that they're doing different things, but they fit together like two pieces of a puzzle. For example, if you're playing in an older style, okay, um, the bass did often have a kind of a staccato feel, and um, but then how much staccato? That's really hard to say. It can be shorter, longer, and sometimes working with bassists, I'd off, I'd maybe ask them to do more or less or sometimes not at all, it, it just really depends. But um, let's listen to a tune now where I'm playing in this kind of 1935 hot club way. And the bass player is playing mainly in a two feel that's staccato and accented.
So in that instance, we were going for something fairly specific. But again, depending on how, on your mood, there are so many things you could do. Um, the bass could be less accented, more accented, more staccato, less staccato, somewhere in between. And you can change feel from section to section or for when you pass like one solo to the next instrument, etc. Should the bass player play in two feel? Should the bass player play in four feel? This can have a great impact on the music as well. And this comes with experience. You have to listen to the lead player. I mean, one tra traditional thing is to play two feel, and then in the B section go to four feel, and then solos in four feel. But again, if you follow this tradition too strictly, it can get very boring as well. You have to be very confident about your musical vision or you need to have a leader who is also very confident and can explain what they want. Sometimes they don't care, sometimes they do. And it's the same for me, it just depends on the mood. Others will insist that for the most part it should be this way, and others will insist it should be another way, etc. There are no rules. One thing that I highly suggest you do is to listen to bands that you really like, and listen to every instrument, listen very carefully to how they play what they play, how they play, how loud they play, etc. For example, if you listen to a lot of Charlie Christian and Benny Goodman, if you listen to when um, Charlie Christian wasn't playing solos, he would play rhythm, listen to how he played the rhythm, or listen to the bass player, listen to what kind of notes they're playing. It's different from the quote-unquote Ray Brown music school of playing bass. There, there's a tendency to play a specific type, a type of bass line. For example, on a blues, instead of a, you would have a, those kinds of bass lines, or Lady Be Good. When you listen very carefully, you're going to notice a lot of very subtle details that while they seem subtle and minuscule, believe me how much they affect the overall picture. So learning to listen is so very important, especially if you're going for something very specific. For example, when I was in Tokyo, I went to quite a number of trad jazz sessions, but I noticed that the rhythm sections often played uh, what they played not in the style of the 30s or 40s, but in kind of a more modern way. It's because, sorry if I offend anyone, that as talented as they are, they didn't do the listening exercise that I'm telling you to do. They just assume that it's played the way they teach you in a music school. Okay, maybe most people don't notice the difference, but people like me, people who really know the style, definitely notice a huge difference. And actually, I think when we play for an audience, people definitely can hear, even if they don't know what it is that's different. Like, for example, um, this recording that I did with Duvet kind of went viral on social media. Um, these, um, I, I love playing with this band. These are musicians where everyone has done their homework, where we discuss together as a group such subtle details. Um, and uh, this is what, this is the result.
to sum things up, what I want you to get out of this video is the listening thing. Go and listen to different great ensembles, Django Reinhardt's groups um, throughout the years. The Hawk Club Quintet, when they played, when they made their first recordings, the way the rhythm section played is different from like the mid 1930s, like recordings like Rose Room, Shine, and where they tended to play in another way. And then after in the 40s, it was the rhythm section was also a little bit different. Very, very subtle. Listen to Charlie Re Christian's recordings with uh, Benny Goodman. Listen to what the bass player is doing. Listen to what the pianist is doing. Listen to what the drums are doing. Or what they are not doing, for example. And as you do this exercise, your ears will become more and more refined and it will give you ideas, hopefully ideas to that you can use to be more musical when you're an accompanist. Notice that when Django Reinhardt worked with drummers, he didn't, I, wouldn't, I don't know if I will say never, but he rarely, if ever, played with this heavy accented feel. He would let the drummer do the work and he would just play more like this. The two and four are not as accented. Django was someone who had such great vision for these subtle details in the accompaniment. Same with Charlie Christian, when he, the way he played rhythm is very similar to the Django in the mid 40s. Like if you check out, um, I don't know, Rose Room. He wasn't doing, because there was a drum already and he's just kind of adding chordal support to the drums, but the drums the drummer is the one putting the accents. So hopefully this gives you some ideas. Let's end this video with, uh, with a clip from the Vavau Eiler Quintet. We'll be playing at the Django Reinhardt Festival in, in two weeks. Yeah, in two weeks. And then I'll be playing rhythm guitar. And then after that, I'll be playing bass with Jimmy Rosenberg. Then I'll come back to Montreal. See you guys then. Thank you.